Today is Sunday, July 5th. We have just come from celebrating a day of declaration of independence for our United States. And although we may be physically distanced here today, we are still one in Christ, and this is a celebration. A celebration of love through Christ, a celebration of forgiveness of sin through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. So welcome to all who have chosen to be a part of this celebration here at First Christian Church, Burleson, Texas. Earlier this week, I was cleaning out a bookshelf at my mother-in-law's house when I came across a neatly wrapped picture frame. As I carefully unwrapped it, wanting to see what was inside and not break what might hold the contents, I noticed it was not a picture at all, but a framed embroidery, which had these words, when I see a fence across my path, I'll make a gate or I'll climb over, but I'm going. This generated a thought. This is what happens to us each and every day. Fences are being placed before us it could be in the form of a poor relationship, doubt, despair, mistrust, disappointment, or lack of self-confidence, so on and so on, blocking us and creating the image we can go no further. The question for you today is, will you allow yourself to be fenced in during this time or turn to Christ who has always had the tools to help build that gate or provide that ladder that's limiting your life. Allow the message today to give you the tools to climb the highest or build the widest gate for your walk toward your spiritual relationship and life with Christ. He is only waiting for your commitment. Let us pray. Great and wonderful Heavenly Father, let us become one with you to feel the glory you have for us and the freedom to do your will. We celebrate today not only the birth of a God-fearing nation, but our freedom to love and worship you here and now. Fill us with your spirit and may the message we are about to hear help us to conquer all the fences that are placed before us. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. It is at this time in our worship service that we lift up to God the concerns that we may have for our loved ones or the ones who have been brought to our attention. Also, we lift up the joys for ourselves and for others, which may lift our spirit. So as we are unable to voice these in person, let us pause in a moment of silence as we reflect and lift our thoughts and prayers up to God for healing, compassion, and or celebration. Let us now pause in silence. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. Let us go to God in prayer. O loving God, creator of all mankind, give to us your mercy, love, and forgiveness. Please hear the heartfelt prayers that have been lifted up to you. Heal us, O Lord, from the inside out and all those afflicted with this terrible virus. Heal our spirit and give us the strength to do what is right in your eyes. Watch over and protect the ones working in the medical field who give themselves for the protection and healing of others. Watch over our first responders and give them the courage and strength to make quick but righteous decisions in the midst of danger. Protect our military and their loved ones and bring them back home safely. And give patience and understanding to our caregivers who take care of our elderly and the people with special needs. Lord, we thank you for another day 
to praise your name as we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Welcome to our children's moment. Here's a great Bible verse. We are helpers. Try saying it. We are helpers. There's a young girl in today's Bible story. We don't know her name, but we know she was kind and a helper. She worked in the house of an important man named Naaman. Well, Naaman got really sick. He had leprosy. Doctors now have medicine to treat it, but back then, leprosy was scary. It made big sores that hurt a lot. It made strong men weak. It made hands and feet not work right. Nobody wanted it. But rich, powerful Naaman had leprosy. The girl in our story told Naaman's wife, I wish your husband would go to Israel, where I used to live. There's a prophet there who could make him well again. How kind and helpful this girl was to speak up and tell the truth. The woman gave the advice to her husband, and he told his boss, the king. And the king said, Naaman, I think you should go see if this prophet can help you. So Naaman went to Israel. When he got there, he was not kind, even though he was asking a big favor. He had to learn that, that God does not care who has money or power. God cares about being kind and respectful like this young girl. If Naaman wanted to get well, he had to learn to do what he was told. Kind of like when we have to take gross-tasting medicine to get better. Well, Naaman complained and complained, but complaining did not make him well. Finally, he did what God's prophet told him to do, and God healed him. Children are important in God's work of love in this world. In today's story, God used a kind and helpful child in healing a powerful man. We, too, can be part of God's plan. Like that girl, we must be kind and care about others. and We must be ready and willing to help. Pray with me. Dear God, make me kind and helpful. In Jesus' name. Amen. Reading from 2 Kings, chapter 5. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive 
from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said. And the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. Well, he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of garments. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you my servant Naaman, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go, wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all he said to you was, Wash and be clean. So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Beloved, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On this hot Sunday with this year's Independence celebration barely in our rearview mirror, it may seem strange a strange time to dive into a rather obscure passage of Scripture buried deep in the dusty history of the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. Yet this is where I ask you to go with me today as we hear the story of one of the Syrian army's great warriors. His name is Naaman. Naaman is a big, tough, and wealthy man who has led Syria in victory after victory against its enemies, raiding their cities, plundering their stockpiles of resources and people. And so today on this Independence Day weekend, we have before us a figure engaged in a battle for independence and freedom. The battle Naaman is waging is not within the hated enemy, not with the hated enemy Israel. It is the battle God has always been engaged in. The battle to bring life out of death. For Naaman, the struggle centers in his own body. No man has ever defeated Naaman, but his body 
is on the verge of defeat. Leprosy is now threatening to undo him. He longs for freedom from a disease that holds him captive. He wants independence from a sickness that in those days meant certain death. Naaman, it seems, is capable of anything except his own salvation. In this story, we discover that the key to the healing of the powerful is vested in a person who has no power. In this case, it's a child. A little Israelite slave girl, the servant of Naaman's wife, offers a suggestion to Naaman. She says in her land, there's a prophet, a man of God named Elijah, and he will be able to cure Naaman of his leprosy. Now we aren't told how far the leprosy has advanced, but we can be pretty sure that for Naaman to listen to this child, the leprosy must be winning the day. Naaman is compelled to listen to her. He has no choice. Staring death in the face does this to people like Naaman. Unwilling to give up with what is left of his life oozing out of his bleeding sores, Naaman listens to the child. It's probably the first time in his life he has paid any attention to a young girl, especially an Israelite slave girl. But perhaps when death's carriage draws close, even the Naamans of the world will have a change of heart. And so Naaman listens to the voice of a child. Her suggestion seems to Naaman rather foolish. His healing, his freedom, his very life, it will not be found within the strong borders of his own country, but in the land of his enemy. The prophet Elijah, this little girl speaks of so highly, lives in Samaria. This must have been like salt thrown on Naaman's leprous body. Not only was he taking directions from a child slave, but she was sending him on a scavenger hunt to a foreign land, lugging hard-won silver gold and silver as gift payment to Israel's prophet. And then when he finally arrives at the prophet's shanty little front door, Elijah doesn't even have the courtesy to come out. Instead, he sends a servant who directed Naaman to go and wash himself seven times in the little filthy creek the Israelites call the Jordan River, when the mighty rivers of Damascus flow through his backyard. It is insulting, and only after having his massive ego stoked by a few more servants does Naaman agree to go to the Jordan, lay down his sword and shield there by the riverside. And much to his surprise, he is free. His flesh, as the story tells us, becomes like that of a little child. His freedom, his independence, his life, all of this because of a little child who became the mouthpiece of the Lord. Naaman is a minor character in this story. The true actor, the one in which God brings about his purposes, is the little girl. This is just like our God who himself ushered in our redemption, who granted our forgiveness, who won his victory not through the weapons of the battlefield, but in the body of a child. Martin Luther said that God became small in Christ. He showed us his heart so that our hearts might be one. It's just like God who would use the voice of a child to, to disarm and heal a great powerful general like Naaman. I wonder, when the world's most powerful leaders get together to fight their wars and broker peace, if when they gather around those important tables, if a baby, some child should not be put in their midst, 
to crawl along the tabletops, to be passed from lap to lap, to be a constant distraction and a constant reminder of what's really at stake. I wonder, I wonder if we really wanted peace, that we would have the mothers of the innocent children from all sides that had been killed in the violence were given the decision-making power. I bet they could broker peace. Naaman discovered that the most powerful, the most healing, the most liberating thing in the world for him was the presence of a child, the voice of a child. Disciples, preacher, teacher, and writer, the late, the late Fred Craddock, told the story of a couple who wanted to be good parents. This girl's parents sent her to church, hoping she'd pick up a good value or two, that she would meet some nice, some nice friends. But they never came with her. They would pull up in the church's circular drive, and the little girl would hop out of the car, and the parents would go out for Sunday breakfast. Now, the father was an upwardly mobile, ambitious executive for a chemical company. He and his wife lived flashy lives. They filled their lives with expensive cars and lavish trips and wild parties. But every Sunday, the little girl was there for Sunday school and church. One Sunday, Fred Craddock looked out over his congregation and thought, there she is with a couple of adult friends. Later, he realized she was there with her mom and dad. When at the end of the service and the invitation was given, the parents, they came forward and told Fred that they wanted to join the church. What prompted this? Craddock, Craddock asked them after the service. Do you know about our parties? They asked. Well, I've Heard many stories about your parties, Craddock replied. Well, we had one last night, and it got a bit loud, and it got a bit rough. There was a lot of drinking. There was too much drinking, and it woke up our daughter. And she came downstairs, and she stood on the third step from the bottom. And when she saw all the food on the dining room table, she said, Oh! Can I give the blessing? God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. Then she smiled, said good night, and she went back upstairs. The party goers began to stammer. Goodness, where did the time go? How did it get so late? I, I suppose we ought to run along. Within two minutes, the house was empty. Mom and Dad picked up the crumpled napkins and the spilled peanuts and the half sandwiches and took the empty glasses on trays into the kitchen, and they looked at each other across the mess. The husband said what they were both thinking. Where do we think we are going? Another pastor told the following story, and I share it with you in his own words. Recently, on a typical weekday, I was in my church office, hunkered down behind my desk, feverishly working on important things, like emails, making phone calls, making sure my Palm Pilot was full enough to, to make me believe I was worthwhile busy, listing all the tasks that needed to be done before evening came. When I, looked up from my from, when I looked up from my desk, there was a little two-year-old girl in the doorway. She was from my previous church. I had spent hours in the hospital by her parents praying over this little girl who, at six months old, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And now here she was, walking into my office, her parents trailing behind. 
I asked them how it was going. Not good, they said. The physicians were providing remarkable care, but the tumor had spread to her spinal cord. Cancer was invading the spine of the little girl. I could tell by the way they looked at me that the prognosis was far worse than merely not good. The little girl looked at me and said, we're going to see ducks in the barely discernible language of a two-year-old. And the mother chimed in, yes, we're going to see the ducks and the flowers in the garden. We finished our visit, and I watched my friends leave the office, a long, clear tube pumping life-giving chemicals into her tiny arteries, banging the back of her unsteady legs as they left. I looked back at my desk and all that important work. My inbox had received 11 new messages in 25 minutes, and a new voice message was waiting for me as well. All those weapons of work and life that we surround ourselves with to give us the illusion that we are in control, that we are important, that if we only work hard enough, we can save ourselves. I felt foolish. The charade had been stripped bare by a two-year-old. A young couple was taking their cancer-ravaged little girl over to the gardens to see the ducks. And I thought I had important work to do. One day, Jesus was walking along and he called his disciples together. They had been bickering about the kinds of things that you and I sometimes bicker about. Prestige, position, success, who was the most important, who was the greatest. And they said, tell us, Jesus, tell us the answer to our questions. And Jesus said, you want answers? You want to know who is the greatest? You want to know how to get into heaven? Here. Become like one of these. And he took a little child and he put it in their midst and he said, There. There's your answer. The most powerful force to ever come upon the face of the earth was a little child. When God sees that the world is spinning out of control, that His creation, humanity, might be lost forever, God wages war on the rebellion by becoming small, by becoming weak, by becoming tender, by taking on the flesh of a little child. May God do so again today and in the days to come. Amen.
We come together today, wherever you may be, may I invite you to join me in our celebration of Holy Communion. You know, in the past, I've heard a few times someone say, I didn't take communion today because I, I just didn't feel worthy. Hmm. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 27 and 28, it says, drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We hear these words and the words about the bread each Sunday when we have uh, Holy Communion. We remember that Jesus sacrificed and we're going to celebrate that Lord's Supper today. It was instituted by Jesus the night before he was uh, put on the cross. This communion, the Lord's Supper, is a celebration, but it is also a confession that we need to be forgiven. Matthew highlights this point as Jesus says that his blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Every time we take the, of the bread and the cup, we remember together that the Lord's Supper is our gift and that we are met and we're given this gift by the grace of God. As we eat and drink, we are assured that God's loving grace overcomes our guilt because of Jesus' sacrifice. May we pray. Dear Jesus, we're sorry for our sins. Thank you for your sacrifice so that we could be forgiven. Amen. And let me, as we come together, let me invite you to join me as we partake of the bread. For Jesus said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And so now at your location, I invite you to join me as we partake of the bread, ministering, you for you, ministering to you in His name, we offer you the bread. In like manner, on that same night, Jesus took the cup and He said, Take, drink, for this is my blood of the new covenant given to you, poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins. And he blessed it and partook and said, take and drink for this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering you to, in his name, may I offer you the cup as we remember the sacrifice that Jesus washed our sins away. May we pray. Dear God, we just love you so much. And we know that we come to you and come at this to this table. That we are not perfect. And we know that you have washed our sins away because of the sacrifice of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now let us receive a benediction. Go in peace, love and care for one another in the name of Christ. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ uplift you. May the love of God embrace you. May the power of the Holy Spirit sustain and support you 
both now and always. Amen.